Father, thank you again for the time to come and, uh, this morning and sit around uh, and uh, your word, to look into it, and to have you uh, speak to us through it. We ask, Lord, that you would prepare each of our hearts to be fed from it. It's spiritual food. It, is, it actually can change, it will change our lives if we allow it to and make us more Christ-like and you know, give us a better understanding and, and Father, encourage our hearts in times of uh, encouragement. Uh, these are the holidays, uh, the special holidays each year from Thanksgiving through Christmas and New Year's and there's supposedly a time of joy and, and, but oftentimes they're a time of great depression and, uh, and uh, just pressures to do things that we wouldn't necessarily do at other times during the year. So we'd ask that you'd superintend over our time here this morning, and we pray that what we say and what we do would be pleasing in your sight, and uh, Lord, just use me as a tool in your hand. Uh, let me add nothing to your inerrant word, and we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. So in the book of Nehemiah, and I did mention, I believe, last week, and you, oops, didn't have your pencil out there, all right. I did mention last week that of all the chapters in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8 is my favorite. It's my favorite chapter. Uh, I mean, there's some interesting things of how he dealt with the building of the wall and his understanding of the forces of evil that were uh, around him, that were bent on interrupting the work, if not, if not stopping it completely. But when we get to chapter 8, we get to the spiritual aspect of these people coming back from captivity. They were sent into captivity, uh, part of punishment. But also, I mean, we have to always remember that the people that went into captivity were the people that the Lord was setting aside for their posterity in, in the future to be part of, of, the, of the coming back into the land. They were the remnant. They were put there. They were put there for their own good. Basically, is what they were going. They were going so far into worldly customs and idolatry that the Lord said, "Enough is enough, and I'm going to, you know, send you into captivity out of the land." And that's what He did. And so they, the wall. Uh, so a number of people came came back at various times. We had Zerubbabel. We have Ezra. We have Nehemiah. Other people that are mentioned as we went through that list uh, last week, and we're not going through that again. But uh, they came back at various times to establish the wall and then establish the temple, the wall. And now, those are the physical things that were d done. Now the spiritual things get entered into which are the more important. And in verse 1 in chapter 8 says, and I'm on page 68, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man in the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So we see that uh, this man Ezra, and we'll see, talk a lot about him during this lesson, this man Ezra commands the people, commands that the, 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 the law, the scroll, the the commandments that the Lord gave to Moses that he told Moses to write down, which Moses did, and these things have been passed on. And so, and he tells them to gather together as one man, and the idea there is that they were there for one purpose. Now, we have a lot of news today on TV about gatherings of people, large numbers of people gathering for different things. In some cases, they may be gathered for one purpose, but usually, it's a mixed multitude, and so those that and so we see a lot of when that happens, then we see a lot of confusion, and sometimes and oftentimes we see violence, but that was not the case here. These people had all gathered for one reason, and the reason was to hear from God through His Word. That's how He speaks to us today. He speaks to us through his word. And uh, he has a lot to say if we would just listen. And so he commands them uh, to bring the book of uh, the law of Moses, which the Lord commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest, in verse 2, uh, brought the law 
before the congregation, both the men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Now, last week we talked about the seventh month being a very important month for the Jewish people. There were three, uh, three uh, uh, feasts during that period of time, a short period of time. There was the Feast of Trumpets. There was the, uh, the uh, Day of Atonement. And then there was the Feast of, of, uh, uh, of Tabernacles. And so uh, we talk, we'll talk a little bit about that maybe later. When Ezra brought the law out and everybody that was gathered, it was not just a few representatives here and there. It was everybody that could be there that could have understanding. Now, a, a, a baby being weaned is, is not going to be understanding. In fact, a one-year-old child is probably not going to be understanding. But when a, So this could very well be to, you know, toddlers or maybe beyond that, maybe six, seven, eight-year-olds. There were probably children there as well, along with the mothers. And so Ezra the priest uh, brings them there and, uh, they, and the book of the law. And so we get into... Uh, they came there. Came they came, then they came by there to hear something, and we know that our faith in Christ has come to us by some, by faith by the by the Word of God working on our hearts. We're saved by God's grace through faith, not through works. The works come after we're saved, not before. And so, uh, so this is on the first day of the seventh month in verse three, and he read therein before the street. Before the street, I'm on page 69, that was uh, before the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand and in the ears of all the people, see there were men and women there, and all the people that were attentive unto the book of the law. So you had a group of people that hadn't, hadn't, had, this, hadn't had this for a while. And uh, there were probably a, a, lot, a number of people there, maybe many, maybe most, that didn't understand what God required of them because they hadn't been told. And we get, we get some information about the Lord and how he functions and how, he, how great he is by, by looking at his creation. But you can't go out and, and stare up into the sky at night and see all those stars and, say, and understand that you need to be saved by grace through faith. You can't understand that. You know there's a great creator, somebody who created all this, all that, all this beautiful and everything in, in, in order. I look at the moon, we have had some great moons out here lately, full moons, sometimes over there and it's still dark and then you, in the morning you come out, it's, it's just after dawn and there's the moon still shining bright and white over there. Incredible, it keeps coming around and it keeps coming around and it keeps, been doing that for 6,000 years. It keeps coming around. It hasn't gone anywhere. It hasn't fallen on top of it. hasn't Because why? Because God put it there and he gave it its, gave its, its direction as to what it should do and when it should do it. It's amazing. It's just incredible to, to, to see that. And so all the men and women were there and they, from, and they read it before in the street from morning until midday. Now midday is noon and morning, you know, morning started for the Jew at, at six o'clock in the morning, or six o'clock in the morning. I'm not sure it's exact, it would be that time. I would think maybe, maybe a little later, but it says from morning till midday. So that could be as much, at least three hours, maybe even, maybe even six. And they were there to hear what, what he had to say. Verse 4, and we get a little information of how it looked there. And uh, in Ezra, the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood, and then th those number of people there on his left hand and on his right hand. So they were going to be helping Ezra deal, get the word out to the crowds. And so they, they raised him up, not, not that they made him higher than, than with regard to his spirituality, but to be heard. You have a large crowd of, of people there and you really need to get above them or they need to be above you in some way separated so that they, the sound gets to, to everybody. He stood on this pulpit of wood, something maybe like a, a, a scaffolding or something. They made it for this purpose. And, uh, and so then in verse 5, and so what does Ezra do? He opens the book in the sight of the people 
for he was above the people, so they could see him. How important is it when somebody's talking to you? So that's why we look at each other when we talk to each other. We don't, we don't come up to each other and then turn our backs to one another and look at the opposite. Well, I guess if you were a spy, maybe you might want to do that to pass on the information. But, you know, it's all about, you know, how we function, you know, when we communicate one with another. He opened the book inside of all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. They stood up because they rever They knew this was something that God had, had cre created and given to the nation of Israel, and it was important. There's nothing in our life more important than this book. Nothing. Th this book. Ha this book has God's message for us. It, it tells us where we're go where we came from, what we're supposed to be doing while we're here. And it also tells us where we're going. And that depends a lot upon our, that depends not a lot, it depends f totally on our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't have that relationship, nothing else that we have will get us into heaven. It's that relationship and that relationship only. We got all kinds of people try, out there trying to work their way into heaven. Says you're not, the Lord God says you're not good enough, you're never gonna get there. Isn't that what the, uh, after the flood, and Noah and the eight, and they came out in the land, and the Lord told them to go and, and repopulate the land. And they, just, they figured they knew better, so they didn't do that. What did they do? They built the Tower of Babel, and they were trying to get, they built it high. They were going to try and get to God by building this, you know, God took care of that, that pretty quick. But uh, man has always been trying to get to God his way. God says there's only one way, and it's by through my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in his finished work on the cross of Calvary, nothing added, nothing taken away, him bearing our sins in his body, shedding his precious blood to pay the full price of our sin debt, for without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. He died, he was buried, he rose the third day, he sits at the Father's right hand, making intercession for us. That's how we talk to God now once we're saved, through the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask things in Jesus' name. It's his righteousness that gets us the communication. And so he's coming again, hopefully soon. And then in verse 6, So the scroll was opened in their presence, and when he opened it, the people stood up in reverence. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen, with the lifting up of hands. <clears throat> and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now you see, the people were part of uh, this. is This is a this is this is a Bible study for them right now. They're going to they're going to be told some things from the Scripture. It's going to be read to them. And uh, when they heard it, and uh, and when he and when he was done sp speaking, I don't think he spoke for three solid hours. He probably spoke a little, and then stopped, and then they replied to him. Amen, amen. What, did, what were they saying? What you just, basically is they were just acknowledging that what he said was true. And, uh, yeah, and amen, amen. When, we, when people say uh, amen, sometimes when people are preaching, they're, they're agreeing with whatever the preacher has said. And it is because so important that we understand that. Preachers can say a lot of things. Bible teachers can say a lot of things that are nowhere near as important as some other things that are said. And all of God's word is important, but the relationship to Christ, there is none more important than that. So they lifted up their heads, they bowed their heads, they were, and they worshiped the Lord. How do you worship the Lord? Well, you praise him, you thank him. He talks about, in the Bible, about the sacrifice of praise. Uh, we obey him. When your parents, when do your parents praise? When you're obedient, when if you, when you're an obedient child, your parents really get to enjoy you, you know, because they can trust you, and they know nothing like an obedient child. And so, uh, in Second Chronicles chapter two, verse five, and when the house was built, uh, which was built, and this is uh, this would be Solomon's house or temple. Uh, they. Uh, for great is our God above all gods. And then I listed there a number of psalms that are really a, 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 
words of praise to the Lord. For the, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all little gods. You know, people say, well, I'm not religious. Everybody's religious. There, there's, in everybody's life, there is one thing that is more important to them than anything else in their life. Sometimes it's their money. Sometimes it's their hobby. Sometimes it's their other possessions. Sometimes it could be a, another person. And sometimes and oftentimes it's themselves. There's nobody more important on this, on this earth than themselves. Everything they do is for themselves. They are a God unto themselves. They become self-righteous. And they become, you know, and, and some people will act, you know, demand obedience. They love power. They, we see it every day in our politics. We, there seems to be nothing more. The people seem to be lying day after day after day, lying without any remorse, without any concern. It, it is because they're trying to achieve something uh, for themselves. Or, you know, it's amazing that people can come in and just lie after lie after lie after lie. You couldn't get away with that 100 years ago. <laughs> You'd be swinging back and forth out there in the wind for some of what's going on very quickly. Well, that's not the lesson. But, and all the people answered on, and so be it, it is the truth. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, there on page 71 up, verse 16, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall thou, he that occupieth the room of the unlearned, say, oh, man, at the giving of thanks, seeming he understandeth not what you say, just what I said. People shouldn't say amen to something they don't know <laughs> the meaning of because you could be blessing somebody for cursing somebody and you, you don't want to do that. So understanding is part part of, uh, of, of our requirement uh, in, in, in the Christian life. We, we're not to be ignorant people. We're not to be ignorant people. And... Uh, they lifted up their hands, they bowed, they bowed their heads. And uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 there, verse 8, I will therefore, uh, I, w I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and, uh, and doubting. It's just, uh, just an act of praise. But it is not a ritual. See, there's a lot of ritual going on today with, with the, the lifting up of hands, so to speak. You see it a lot in uh, you see it a lot in sports. You know somebody does some something that somebody did worked out well for their team, and they they start pointing to the uh, above. It. That's not you know that's not what the that's just ritual. That's that just happens every time. It's just it's just ritual. That's not what's being talked about here. There's nothing wrong with you when you know that God is so holy, and, and that we in our own flesh cannot even talk to him we have to go through his son you realize that that when he tells us something and we understand it and we can see how it, it needs to be applied to our life to make life more understandable you know there's nothing wrong with looking up and uh, opening up and praising God for what he's done you know we don't have to be embarrassed about praising God and, uh, and, and, uh, and then, uh, what I said here, the bowing of the heads is still done in, in most, if not all, Christian worship, but the lifting up of hands has a divided following on that. The charismatic and Pen Pentecostal movements place more emphasis on the Holy Spirit than they, than they do on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's tragic because the Holy Spirit is important. But it was said, the Lord told us, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, when I, when I, get, when I go to the cross and when, I, and when I go back to heaven, the Comforter is going to come. And that was the Holy Spirit. And he says, he will speak of not himself, but of me. So uh, when the Holy Spirit in, indwells the, the believer, it, it's, he's, not, he's, trying, he's speaking to us about the Lord Jesus Christ and, and following him and doing what... But he has said, we, we, don't, we, worship, we worship God, the Father. We worship the Son. We worship the Holy Spirit. They're all, they're all God. God in three persons. Don't fully understand that. Can't explain it to you. Nobody else can. But when the Comforter has come, it says here in John chapter 15, verse 26. This is the Lord Jesus Christ himself speaking. 
when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, what is it? He shall testify of me. And so the focus of, of, the, of the New Testament church is the Lord Jesus Christ, not the Holy Spirit, although the Holy Spirit is the presence of God in the world today. Because the Father is in glory, the Lord is at his right hand, and the church is dwelt by the Holy Spirit when we trust Christ as our experience, our, as our Savior. And, and then and some of the, the Pentecostal and, and, and can you be a charismatic, charismatic and be a, a, a Pentecostal and be saved? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are going to be plenty of charismatic and Pentecostal people in, in heaven. But right now, in, in many of the churches, the, the focus is on emotion, getting everybody worked up and feeling good and crying about songs. I've been, I've been to those places. I mean, it's a very moving kind of thing. You go in and with uh, 20 minutes, pretty soon you're crying because they're singing songs that you know are moving. You know. Anyway, that's not the lesson. We teach our children to fold their hands in prayer, but in the Bible, the folding of hands is mentioned twice, both in regard to a lazy person. <laughs> so it does talk about the folding of hands, but it's, I think it's in Proverbs, it talks about a lazy person folds his hands, probably like this, you know, or something like that. Anyway, interesting. Verse 7. So we get to some more people here in Joshua and Benai and Sherebiah and Jam and Achab and Shabbathiah, Hodijah, Masaiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peleiah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So Ezra spoke. He spoke a certain amount of, we're not told exactly how much he spoke at one time, certainly not, not the three or four hours at one time. But after he spoke, then there were people that were assigned to him that were to go out into the audience or out into the congregation and explain what he had said and what God, to give the sense. That's what we're doing here this morning. We read the scripture and then we say, now what does that mean? Well, the people needed to know that because they had a long time not been fed any of God's word. And so now they needed to be taught probably some very basic things. This could be these people here that are mentioned, these names. Could, this could be a mixture of priests and Levites. I suspect they were all at least Levites. We see the important, uh, and, and here again, we see the importance of the sentence that was taken and the validation of those who, who were Levites. Remember, there was, there was a vetting of all the people to see who was, who was authorized and who God had set apart to do, do the teaching and the preaching. Not just anybody. Today, ordination is, you know, when we ordain somebody, we don't make them any smarter. We don't, we don't make them any more spiritual. What we do is we just, it's a, just a pu public decoration that we or whoever is, is ordaining them believe that these people are qualified to preach and teach God's word. I mean, and so, you know, we, we, they go to Bible college or they go to seminary or cemetery, however you want to look at it. And uh, you, you can learn a lot of bad stuff in, sem in seminaries and in Bible college today. You know, so you don't have to go there. But if somebody is going to want to be an, a missionary or a preacher or a teacher, there ought to be somebody, people ought to say, you know, he's qualified to do that. And that's, and these people were, justified to be qualified to do that, probably by their, uh, their, uh, their lineage right now, because we're going to see <laughs> they needed some work too here anyway. But First Timothy chapter 5, verse 22 say, says, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be a partaker of other man's sins, keep thyself pure. What's, what's Paul telling the Timothy? Don't, don't, it's the laying on of hands, that's kind of a, you get somebody in a chair and you maybe have three or four men from the church around them, they just lay their hands on his, on his, on his shoulder or something. And then there, there are people out in the audience. And what they're about to tell the audience out there is this man is qualified to preach and teach to you. 
that's about that's what ordination is. It, 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 there's no no dove coming down and landing on his head or anything. That's what it is. This man we have found qualified to preach and teach unto you. That's what ordination is. Does a person have to be ordained to be a teacher or a preacher? No. But it helps. It helps to know that that somebody has at least checked them out because Paul is saying here, what? Lay hands on no man suddenly. You don't want, somebody comes in and they're all enthusiastic and they're showing up at every church service and they're reading their Bible and the next thing you know somebody says, hey, can you teach the kids a Sunday school class? Bad, bad decision because that person probably doesn't know enough of the Bible and doesn't know the context of the, of the verses to properly teach. And so you wind up with kids or even adults being taught wrong theology, wrong Bible, because the person that was teaching them didn't know it enough, wasn't qualified to do it. So Timothy is telling, he, his responsibility was to get the church going or get it straightened out and then put somebody in charge of, of things to carry on while he went and did some other things and went some other place. Do not let enthusiasm be a substitute for, for qualities. You know, you can have false, false preachers and teachers that are very enthusiastic. I mean, many outstanding preachers were never ordained by anyone but God. Yeah, you know, so, you know, it, it, don't be, we go into the doctor's office, right? And we look around and you see all these little things on the wall that says certificate of this and certificate of that. Well, for your doctor, it's real. If he's if he needs brain surgery, it's really good if he's at least graduated from some medical school somewhere. Uh, but it's not. Sometimes all those th things are done is just to give you confidence. If you don't, you you don't even know where they got. They might have got them online. You know, if you want me to have a doctorate, I'll tell you what. After the meeting here, I can get online and I can pay fifty bucks. And I can have a certificate in the mail on a scroll and everything all nice and I can put it on my wall here that says I'm a doctor of divinity or something like that. Well, I'm not. But, but there are people out there with those kinds of credentials. And uh, sometimes they get away with it and sometimes they don't. And so, uh, and so uh, where am I? I lost myself here. Oh, it caused the people to understand the law there at the top of page 72. And so uh, there, there was a language issue as well as one of ignorance there too because we had some, you know, mixed, we had people coming back to, uh, f from Babylon and from Persia that had been born and raised in a different language, you know. And so while Hebrew may have been, ex may have, it was not the language of communications there in, in the captivity. So uh, there was a language issue as well as one of ignorance. We tried to do this in Sunday school, but few attend and, and few re and, 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 cho and choose to remain ignorant. Every believer, especially teachers, is commanded to study the Bible. Teachers and, and, and preachers are commanded to study the Bible. And 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. What does rightly dividing the word of truth means? It means understanding what God says in the context. If you ignore the context, you can get it wrong every time. So rightly dividing is understanding what God is saying. And then, how does it apply to our life? There, there are things in here that we will read about that, that we will get and we'll get a right understanding, but it may not, there may not be any obvious application for us. And then, there, and, then and yet there might. And the people stood in their place, nobody left the service, and I think the sense is that they remained attentive. They wanted to be, they were, they were, they were hungry for some spiritual food. Verse 8. So they, read it, so they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, clearly, they didn't, so that the words were clear, and gave the sense. That's, that's what biblical teaching and preaching does. You read God's word, 
and then you give the sense. What, it, what does it mean for me? Well, or what does it mean for Israel? Or is what it means for Israel different than what it means for me? They gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. It's wonderful. You know, we teach, we teach young, young people in the churches to memorize certain things. I can remember, I remember the 23rd Psalm, all of it, because I was taught it in Sunday school when I was in grade school. We used to have religious instruction in grade school every Wednesday afternoon at 1 o'clock. We went to one of our, the local churches for two hours to do paper mache and get ourselves in all the glue in our hands and stuff. But we also learned to memorize Psalms. So for all of my life, uh, adult life, I've known the 23rd Psalm. But that's, <laughs> that's hardly in the Bible. That's just one thing. And so these people probably had something. But they didn't have enough to be able to live, you know, within God's direction. So it says here, they read in the book distinctly, it is doubtful that all these men had copies of the law to read. You know, that we fortunately, we all have copies of the Bible. They didn't have copies of any of this. And more probably is Ezra and the men on the platform that were reading from the book of the law. So they gave the sense. These men would give the sense of the reading. This is what we call expository preaching is done this way. You take a section of scripture, verse by verse, even the words by words at times, and give the sense of its meaning, that is, its interpretation. So every word of scripture, every word in this, in this book has one interpretation, one interpretation but it could have many applications here this is the ver this is what the verse says and this is what it means in the context in the context and so applications may be many but the interpretation is singular only one interpretation they would have to translate also into aramaic also look at the difficulty here because of the multilingual culture now and we have, we, have ju we have just created a multilingual culture. This was a English-speaking country. English is the world's common language for communications. We talked about this. You, go, you fly in an airplane to any country in the world. When you're coming in for a landing and you're talking to the control tower, you will be speaking in English. No matter what other la what other language there is, that's why pilots can flow in and out of different countries, take off and landing because the single language of English is the, in the days of, uh, of, the, of the Lord. What was the common language? It was Greek. Greek was the common language. Everybody communicated and did business in Greek. Anyway, so there was many. There was there was it was multilingual in a cause. So they needed to cause them to understand. The interpretation would include the context. Always the context. Those who claim to be Christians but are not saved often pull verses out of the context. Judge not, lest thou be judged. That the Bible says that, but you got to read the verses before and after it. It doesn't mean that we never judge. See, the, you know, the people pull that out. And, 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 you know, and they think, well, that's biblical. It's in the Bible, but it's, it, it, you need the context. Verse 9, and Nehemiah, which is, which is uh, the Teshatra, and that would be another, that would probably be the Persian word for governor. And Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people. See, if you keep reading on, you find out who taught. It was the Levites. Uh, taught the people and said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. And, and so we have these, these people, Nehemiah, which is the Teshatra and Ezra. It's a holy day unto the Lord. It was a feast day. It was a feast day. Remember, we, we, this is the time of those three feasts. The feast that, It was a feast day. It was, it, it was the, fe uh, the new moon and the feast of the blowing of the trumpets. Remember the trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and, and the Feast of Tabernacles. These are feasts. People actually got around food and ate and, and enjoyed it. It says, mourn not nor weep. 
This was to be a day of celebration. But with the reading of, of the book of the law, these people were convicted of their sins and aware of the wrath of God that could be brought upon them at any time for their disobedience. And so for all, all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. This was, this was what we call people were convicted of their sin. You, you can tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ and that he paid, paid, went to the cross and paid for their sins and that their sinners were born sinners. Clearly we're born with that old nature. We're born sinners. We're sinners by birth. We're sinners by choice. I mean, we choose to sin. We, we, you know, we don't all go rob stores or do things like that, but we all do things sinfully. We say wrong things. We use wrong words. We, we say things to people that we regret. We say, all, you know, those are sins. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. And, and, the, and then we know that the penalty of sin is death. Spiritual death. Everybody's going to, well, unless, until the rapture comes, everybody's going to experience physical death. But without Christ, they're going to experience spiritual death, the second death, which is far worse. So the people wept. We don't see much of that today. No, we don't see much of that today. These people are out from, from among their captors and back among like-minded people. We see that happening today. <laughs> Turn on the news. We got these uh, captures, captives that the Hamas took. You know, and now they're coming. Some of them are coming back to their families. You know, after a terrible, you know, a life-changing experience from probably all of them. Uh, but these people, you know, they hadn't. Heard, they've been living in Persia. And they've been speaking Aramaic, and they've been speaking Persian, and you know maybe, you know, not probably not a lot of Hebrew. Now they're hearing it, and they're being told what it's what it meant, what it said, and what it meant. These people were out from among their captors and among like-minded people. First Corinthians fifteen thirty-three: Be not deceived; evil communications corrupts good manners. Don't want to hang around sinful people. It's going to rub, it is sure to rub off on you. And so sin is so pervasive and bold in our society today that we tend to compare our personal testimony with it rather than with the Lord Jesus Christ. We do that. That's the way, that's the, that's the way Satan works. That's the way our old nature works. We see all this stuff on television. To turn it on, it's awful. Killing, you know, all the killing and the looting and the college kids cheering for the enemy and the evil people and we say oh boy I'm glad I'm not like that you know we start comparing ourselves and saying you know we're, 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 we're doing we're pretty good after all that's the wrong thing to do we're comparing ourselves sinners comparing ourselves with other sinners we need to compare ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ that's what we're being told that's where the comparison means where do we find out what we find that out in the book, especially in the New Testament, and all that he has done for us. I believe, you know, this was a Lot's situation. Remember the story of Lot, uh, uh, Abraham's nephew, and uh, Abraham and, and Lot became so prosperous in, in, their, in their dealings that they had so many cattle and servants and people that really, as they were going along together, they really couldn't function. There, there was... Everything was getting mixed, and so there was a decision to separate. Abraham would go one direction, Lot would go the other. Abraham being the older, he had the first choice. But he gave the first choice to Lot, or actually God did. And so what did Lot do? He looked towards the really green, beautiful place towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, he didn't see what was going on in Sodom, I don't think, in Sodom and Gomorrah yet. But he saw that wonderful physical green you know what should have Lot done well in my opinion he should have said no uncle Abraham you know you, you need to go first you, you he didn't do that he, and he went and then he went and lived in uh, in Sodom and, Gom and Gomorrah which was a a you know we say why was Sodom and, and Gomorrah 
destroyed by God because they were homosexuals? No. Well, what was it? Well, we're told uh, the pride, pride of life, fullness of bread, and the abundance of leisure. And if you look at our country today, that's exactly where we are. Look at, we're living in this, those people, <laughs> 99% of the world doesn't even live in, I mean, they don't, they don't even have, you know, they don't live anything like this. And uh, pride of life, you know, we, we got, we're so proud of our, you know, we can go out and we got stores and we shop on, I mean, we, we, we do all this and, and we want a four day or a three day work week so that we can play. There's nothing wrong with a little leisure, but but when you are absorbed by it and it, it's, it's the focus of your life, you know, my next cruise or my next party or my next outing or my next trip to go skiing or my, I mean, it goes on and on and on. The abundance of leisure. God says, you know, where's where's the time for me? Well, I would have been there on Sunday, but, you know, I had to catch a plane that was, you know, to go, you know. Sunday's the Christian travel day. It's supposed to be, people are supposed to be worshiping the Lord on the Lord's day, but, you know, best to, you know, best to work your, work your schedule around the Lord's day. And sometimes it's hard, very hard. So where was I? All right, so, uh, talked to him not so we got there at the bottom. Uh, it's page seventy-three, and Peter, Second Peter, chapter two, verse seven and eight, and delivered just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for that righteous man. When a man's called righteous, that means he's he's a child. He's gonna he's gonna go to heaven. So Lot was a believer. I mean, he'd been around Abraham for a long time, but he foolishly chose to go in and live amongst sinners. And it says he was vexed. He wasn't a homosexual. He didn't practice that. He wasn't a transvestite or he didn't ask for a change in his sexual makeup. He was none of that. But he went in and lived among them and worked among them. And what happened, the Lord sent a couple of angels to get him and his family out. And who came out? Not even half of his family. I think he had three sons that were married. I can't remember. But he went to them and they laughed at them. They laughed at their father. <laughs> You're joking. We're not leaving this place. We're having such a good time here. And then his wife. So, he, so him and his wife and his two daughters were pulled out, literally pulled out of the city. And the wife turned back and says, I don't want to leave you. God says, fine. And he left her there. And so Lot wound up with two daughters and himself. And then other bad things happened. So for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, he, he saw what was going on and he heard what was going on. And yet he just chose to listen to all that stuff. Vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You know, he probably looked at it and said, oh, I can't believe what they're doing. I can't believe what they're doing. I can't believe what they're doing. Well, get out of there. And he didn't choose to do that. The scenery was too good. Maybe the stores were open on Sunday. You know what I'm saying. When we grew up, you know, there were, stores weren't open on Sunday. You couldn't find anything open on Sunday. We have what they call blue laws. I'm not sure why it got like that, but in Pennsylvania they were called blue laws. Nothing was open. Occasionally, they, they worked their way in where one of the movie theaters was open, and you, got, you have a line, <laughs> a line of people around the corner waiting to get in. To get, it didn't make any difference what was playing. <laughs> anyway, verse 10. How am I doing, Fred? What, what's the time? I'm almost. Quarter two. Quarter two, okay. Verse 10, then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is a holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So this was a day of celebration. 
and we have a lot to be thankful for. We just celebrated Thanksgiving, but frankly, you know, it's disgusting. I mean, the, the Christmas decorations went up before Thanksgiving. There was more focus on Christmas than there was on Thanksgiving. I mean, Thanksgiving came and went, and hardly anybody noticed. There were five turkeys out on the golf course over there by the dumpsters the other day in the, in the morning, so you could see them. They were, they were happy Thanksgiving was over. <laughs> they were just having a good time out there. They were finding their, they were having their meal. But this was supposed to be a time of celebration. It was to be a time of rejoicing and sharing, you know, because there were some people that didn't have anything. And uh, our up upcoming Thanksgiving is a celebration, as a feast which we give thanks and rejoice in the Lord's provision. That's what it's supposed to be. It was also a time of sharing for those who had to make provision, because who had to make provision for those who had not. So they were told everybody was going to have something to eat. Everybody was going to have something to drink. You know, if some, it needed to be, to be provided for them. There was, and, there, and there's joy in giving. There's real joy in giving. And so, Acts 20, verse 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. There's great, there is great blessing in giving. You know, if you give with the right heart, it, 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 there is. And, and it's, it's just amazing. For the Lord, it says here, for, the, for this day is holy unto the Lord, neither be ye sorry, sorry, sorry. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word joy doesn't, doesn't always mean laughter. And uh, nor, do I, nor do I equate joy with happy. Uh, you look at the word happy and you will find out that it has the sense of a chance or of sensual ha happens. It's, it's kind of a, a, you take the word happen, if something happens and you take off the two N E N and you put a Y there and you get happy. So usually something happy is, comes when it's, it's a circumstance, something, you know, comes, comes by. But the joy, go, joy goes deeper than that. It, uh, you will find that it has a sense of chance and sensual pleasure. We get happy and then we get, we get happy and sad in, in the same breath. And joy isn't like that. Joy, on the hand, other hand, is not rooted in chance, but rather for the Christian in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the promises of God. You, you can have joy in the midst of a trial. You know, you should, can be going through a bad time, bad, bad, bad uh, input from the doctor, uh, checkbook, uh, checking account doesn't look like you want it to. The car's not running well. It's in the shop. But if you look beyond that, and Christians should always look beyond that and know that these are the things that James talks about when he says, count it all joy, not all fun, not all happiness, but you count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or trials. Why? Because it's only temporary. <laughs> and we need to look forward beyond, beyond the grave. Look, we, we have a, a glorious future. And uh, things on, on this earth are winding down for me. You know, I'm in the twilight of my life. You know, this, uh, it's going down. The body is casting off its energies. You know what I'm saying? But there's joy. You could have joy in that. You can have joy in the midst of great trials. Psalm 21, verse 1, to the Psalm of David, The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, in thy salvation. How great, greatly shall he rejoice. In Psalm 32, verse 11, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that have an upright heart. Habakkuk 3.18, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. What did, what did Job say? I'm going to probably, though he, he said, though he slay me, with all he was going through, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That was, Job wasn't happy about what he was going, but he, he, knew, he knew beyond his trial <laughs> there, was, there was something great for him. Verse 11, so the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, 
for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. So uh, it, was, it was probable that some or perhaps many were so overcome with emotion that they could not stop their weeping or mourning. So they had to be t t settled down and, and you know, and uh, be joyful. And uh, the Levites then helped them to gain their composure as they were affecting those around them. Their hearts needed to be turned from grief to joy and gladness. One way to do that is to count your blessings, name them one by one. We sing that song all the time. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your many blessings, count them one by one. Count your messy, many blessings, count them. Verse 12, and all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. So we don't have the exact words that were that uh, that was that Ezra had spoken, but now they they knew them and now they understood them, and now they were dispersed to go and uh, to go and eat and drink. The feasting the feast was to begin and in sweet fellowship, and sent portions and to make great mirth. Those that had to send to those that had not. It was a festive occasion to, to, to share with everybody. Those, those kind of, kinds of things. We have in our past picnics, you know, group picnics. Sometimes they would have block parties that our, when I grew up. They'd block off two parts of a road and, and there'd be block parties that, and things like that. People would get together. And picnics were always fun. Because it was always food. It was always food, always food, and so because they understood the words that were declared to them, how many people today leave church joyful because they heard the scriptures and understood the interpretation? I mean, I guess if you stood outside the church door when people go out and say, "What did you learn today?" and how do you apply it to your lives? How many people would would even remember what the subject matter was? But that's the way it's supposed to be. Of course, if they have not heard the Bible, read the Bible, and explained it, this you know this verse would not this verse would not mean anything would not be applied to them. So in verse thirteen, and on the second day, so that, that's just the first. They got a lot in that first day. So the second day, they were gathered together. The uh, second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. So, uh, don't forget, the people that were on Ezra's stand and the people that were amongst the crowd trying to get the, 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 the word and the understanding down to the people, these were people that had been in captivity as well. So they've been away from it for a while. So Ezra's got some work on his hands here. Those that had responsibility to teach others in the law were now gathered unto Ezra. Why Ezra? Well, this Ezra, and we see this in, in, in Ezra chapter 7, verse 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe of the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. So this, this Ezra knew his knew his Bible. Even in captivity, he studied and knew his Bible. So he was qualified. He understood the Bible. He understood what it meant. He understood the application. So Ezra regularly studied the scriptures. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in, within you when meekness and fear. Well, what's that about? Well, there's, we should know enough as, as believers. We should know enough that if somebody comes up to us and says, how do I get to heaven? How do I get saved? We need to be able to tell them that. We, we are responsible to be able to tell them that. It says here again, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you what? The reason of the hope. What is the hope? My hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. My sins are forgiven. I'm a child of God. I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to the lake of fire. I'm not going to hell. 
That's my hope. It's, it, it's not a wish. It's my hope. And so I, I share that. You share that with other people. I'm going to heaven. I want you to come. Here's how you get there. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what First Peter says. That's, and so even to understand the words of the law, it seems that in the performing of their duties that day, I'm at the top of page 75, that they had had some difficulty in understanding what was being read. They would have difficulty, if they have difficulty in that, then they would have difficulty in giving the sense because they didn't understand it themselves. So, you know, this was a, this was a tough sell. They had this free, they, you know, this was a time of feast and season. So they were, they were celebrating the Day of Atonement, uh, the, the Feast of Trumpets, and the Feast of Tabernacles. They were all coming kind of in a row there. And so they were trying to do that, and at the same time, they're trying to get some, some uh, Bible, some of, of the law, back into the people. And there was very few people there qualified to do it. In fact, when you look at the scriptures here, it seems like Ezra was the only one that was really fully qualified to do what was needed. Nehemiah was already passed off the scene. He had already died. He wasn't around anymore at this time, so... Anyway, and the, uh, there's never a point in the Christian's life, never a point in the Christian's life that he should stop reading and studying the Bible. And there's nothing more dangerous to the soul than having that soul under an ignorant teacher. I mean, it's, it, and there's a lot of that going on in the world today, a lot of it. In fact, most of what is, calls itself Christ, Christianity is, 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 is being taught falsely or not taught at all. Not all false teachers, not all false doctrine is taught deliberately. <coughs> Nevertheless, it's just as deadly. So you have some, that's, that you go back to what, what was told, Paul told Timothy, lay hands on no man suddenly. Make sure that the person that you're ordaining to go and teach and preach to others is qualified to do it. And how do, how do you do that? Well, you, you sit under them, you, 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 you know, we have all kinds of capability today to check on people. But even when you do that, you cannot be sure <laughs> until they get in the position. Because some people hide their true beliefs until they get in places of authority. That's what governments do. That's what politicians do all the time. They never really tell you who they are or what they believe until they get in, in the work and then you're pretty, and then you're disappointed. Okay, so let's see. And we're gonna, we'll go ahead and start. I think we stop there. I think it's a good place to stop. But I mean, this is Old Testament stuff, but it's, it's so relevant to today to make the application. We can, we can see these things that were happening there. You know, you, you picture them there and, and you don't see any telephone poles or antennas or phones or any of that, but you see people being taught scripture and being told what it means and then they're being told how to apply it to their lives. If You don't apply every verse to your life. I mean, but there's some there that clearly that needs to be done. So it's so applicable, and we see this stuff going on in our world today. And you say this is twenty. This stuff. This is this is a twenty-five hundred year old book. Not twenty-five year old. Twenty-five hundred year old book. You got you got science books in in uh, in, in colleges that. Uh, in the next edition, last year's will be out of date. You can't, you can't even turn them in. They won't even buy them back anymore. You just throw them away. That's where we live today. Father, thank you again for the time we've had in your word this morning. We praise you for your goodness. We thank you for your long suffering with this and your putting up with our ungodliness. Lord, just help us to come to you and, and try to be more like your son each and every day. Uh, we love him. We love you. We just pray your blessing on the day. Get, take us from here. and Whatever message you had in our heart today, finish it in our lives, Lord. And uh, may we be uh, uh, give out your word to others and encourage them to find a place to, to worship and to serve and to 
and to study, and we just ask it all in your son's precious name. Amen.